Hi guys, on this episode we cover Lexi's 30 by 30, her 30th country by her 30th birthday. We talk about her accomplishing the goal, what she qualifies as actually visiting her country, her different philosophy for traveling, and what it means to her. I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's talk about what you've been doing for the last 30 years, like your goal. You have this concept, 30 by 30, mm-hmm. that you really embarked upon, and we're going to go in on that, okay? Okay. Mm-hmm. You began 30 by 30 at how old? Uh, 23. So that's seven years. Yes. And at 23, how many countries had you been to? Been to about seven, I want to say. Seven countries. Yeah. So... 30 by 30, 23, you have been to seven countries, which meant you had, what, 23 more countries to go mm-hmm. to in a seven-year time. So yes. 23 countries in seven years. And the funny thing is, is that at 24, I only went to one new country. I went to Italy. Okay. 25, I only went to one new country, Cuba. Okay. So from 25 on... I was at a breakneck pace. I needed to go to between like seven to nine countries a year to make that work. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. you can't repeat the same city in a country. So you cannot repeat the same country. Your mm-hmm. rules are, what were your rules? So I needed to leave the airport, have a meal, and do something cultural. And you still had, so you already had been to, so you had 22 countries to mm-hmm. go to in five years. Yeah. That's more traveling than most people do in a lifetime. Well... I mean, I've always wanted to travel. Now, I feel like the groundwork needs to be laid that we are sisters growing up together. We are. Yep. That's why we have that familial resemblance. We're like twinsies. I know. But I think, like, even starting really young, I've always just wanted to travel a lot. And so at, like, 12 years old, I was looking up um, study abroad summers in Switzerland because I wanted to glacier ski. Mm Mm-hmm. In hindsight, I'm really happy that that never happened because I couldn't imagine me, A, on a glacier and B, skiing. (laughs) I'm not a dive. She's so clumsy. I don't think she would have been able to. Uh, I don't think I would have gotten far in. However, it didn't even occur to me that those programs are like $40,000 and trying to ask like a single mother, like, hey, can you send me to Switzerland for the summer? I mean, it's totally feasible. Some people do that, though. I know. And I don't know what in my life made me think that that was part of my life. But then after that dream had to be given up, I thought, okay, here's a program to go to Spain so I can learn Spanish for the summer. (laughs) (laughs) Equally as feasible. Um, But like not having those opportunities, I realized when I got older and I got to an age and I realized, go see the world. Right. Now is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So at 21, I had been to two countries before, um, Mexico, like we did a cruise to Ensenada. Fun. Which counts. Oh, I guess you actually went in the country. Ensenada is in Mexico. Okay. We did tequila tasting. Yeah. We did. So there was events. Okay. Yeah. There were events. There was food. It counted. But, I mean, I've gone back to Mexico since then if you need, like, a more official Mexico (laughs) trip. Because apparently you're you're questioning trips already. Right. But um, then moving to Japan, uh, it was kind of amazing just being out there and living life. And then finally I backpacked after Japan and I met someone on a tour of the Mekong Delta in Vietnam who was turning 30. And Mm -hmm. they'd mentioned that this was their 30th country. And... I don't know what in my life made me think it because at that point I'd been to maybe like five or six countries Mm -hmm. and I thought, you know what? I could do that. Now, mind you, I was also 24 at the time having only been to like five or six countries. So to think in the next seven years I can go to 24 more countries is, I mean, it's pure hubris is what it was, but I just thought that's what I'm going to do. Right. So after I left Japan and after I finished, um, my, my backpacking experience, then I ended up working for an airline. And at the time I was like, oh, this is just going to be temporary because I didn't realize how big of a role it was going to play in my life and achieving this goal. So with that in mind, I stayed, um, I stayed with the airline and now I fly everywhere non-revenue, which is basically like flying standby at a cheaper rate. Mm-hmm. And that has given me the world to do. So you embarked upon your travel. 
yeah. for 30 by 30. And that was the goal that you set at 24. Yes. All right. So we're going there. What's your personal travel philosophy? When, when you embarked upon this, like, what do you consider travel? Like, what is it that means, that travel means to you? I mean, travel is like breathing. Travel is like all of the freedom in the world to be able to get up and go mm -hmm. and to find something entirely new to you. Maybe not new to the residents of wherever you're going, right. but outside of everything that you knew before it. Mm -hmm. Now, since you did question whether I actually went to Mexico, I just want to jump in and tell you <laughs> that I do have requirements for where I go okay. to qualify. Right. So the first thing is I have to leave the airport or train station. Okay. It just means you can't like go through, do a connection and consider yourself having been there. Next, I have to have had a meal. Now I've made some exceptions on that and considered coffee and like a snack a meal. Okay. And then third, I've had to do something cultural while I was there. But so, snacks in some countries, culture and a croissant is it is is a meal. Yeah, like so Vatican City, I count as a country a because it's like a country with its own state leader, okay. the Pope, okay. and I there I had espresso and a Danish, and I was like, well, that's that counts because espresso is literally an Italian tradition. So right. and I had it in the Vatican while looking at the art, which is doing something cultural. So okay. even within like an afternoon tour of the Vatican, cover the country. So it is not just going through, leaving out, getting the stamp in your passport, and then flying through. It's not a long, yeah. it could be a long layover, but it's not a layover where I just stepped out through mm -hmm. customs to come back through immigration and get my stamp. No, you have to do more. So like South Korea was probably, next to the Vatican, my shortest country. Right. Um, with that... I had maybe an 18 hour layover, so I left the airport, I did, well I did like their tour in the airport, which was cool because they had a little procession of people dressed like royalty mm. coming through. I went to go see Django Unchained. Wow. I know. That's, you saw that in South Korea? I did. At the theater? Yes. Was that cultural? <laughs> did you consider that cultural? No, after I went to a Korean bathhouse. That's cultural. I got scrubbed. I got to uh, just hang out naked in those tubs. It was fun. Right. Um, it was a unique experience. I enjoyed it. Okay. And because my flight was overnight and I didn't want to pay for a hotel, I just decided to sleep in the Korean bathhouse. Right. Which is a thing that people do. They just have like little like couches and mats set up and everyone's just out there like it's a weird shelter. And I thought, this is fine at this stage of my life. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> so to not jump ahead, but mm -hmm. now that you've done 30 countries, you are 30, mm -hmm. what would you sum up why you love travel? I understand that your travel philosophy, like I love to travel because it's like breathing, but like what would you sum it up as? I mean, travel is really, it's interesting. It gives you a different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. So I feel like for some people, they can live their life never really needing to leave their corner of the world. Right. But with that, the world is going to look so much bigger and right. so much scarier. And by going all of these different places, one thing I realize is that the world is incredibly accessible. It's, it's there, and I would imagine it's something that wants you to explore it. But also that it's, it's just people living their lives, trying to pay their bills right. everywhere you go. Because you can think that some place is scary or it's dangerous, but mm -hmm. literally everywhere I've gone, I've at least met a few nice people that are just going to work, mm -hmm. coming home with their friends, with their family, right. and it kind of makes the entire world seem less scary. Right. It makes everything seem so everyday and mundane, which is weird to embark on that to like go see exciting new things just to find out that it's all the same. Right. So we should talk about the mm. different ways that travel has changed over the years. When mm. you started, you were 24. So that, what year was that? 2013. So 2013. Today is 2019. Mm. The world has completely changed in the um, seven years that you've done it. What would you say, how do you choose your locations? Like, how would you have picked these locations in 2014 versus 2019? Mm -hmm. Seeing that the Instagram culture, social media con culture has completely grown in that time span. It's totally changed the game. So, 
like at 24, I mean, the first thing that I was looking for was, can I get there? Mm -hmm. Can I try and get there cheap? Um, the other thing was, can I go to places that I've heard about my entire life? Right. So, um, like the trip that we took in 2013 or 2014, yes. we went to uh, Thailand. So right. we went that to was our first trip together. Yeah. Right. And that was that was a really exciting trip. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, we didn't go to. We did Koh Samui, and we were supposed to do the full moon party for yes. New Year's, right? That was going to be epic, actually. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're bringing in the New Year's, we're going to do Copen mm -hmm. Copen Yang, and we'll yes. do the full moon. But I think today, if we did it, we would still go, regardless if the bus, the boat was rocky or it rains yeah. eight hours. So life has changed for that. Things that were daunting then are not daunting now. Right. For me personally. Only because at that time in my life, I would go to places based on whether I heard it was safe right. and also whether it's somewhere that I grew up wanting to go. So earlier places that I chose, like going to Italy, right. granted that wasn't really intentional, but I thought this is somewhere I've always wanted to explore, mm -hmm. so I'm going to go here. Whereas now, because I've been a lot of places and the world does feel very small in a way, now it's like... How do I find something remote? How do I find something that's really off the beaten path? So in 2014, how did you choose your locations? So in 2014, well, a little bit of it was what can I afford? Right. That <laughs> because was normal. Particularly, um, like 2013, I left my job teaching English in Japan. Right. And I just had like a lump sum of money and no job prospects. And I thought, well, I'm going to do something. So I thought, I'm just going to go backpacking down Vietnam and up Cambodia for a month and a half. Mm -hmm. And with that, those are two places that you can go, especially when you think of like backpackers right. living their, their lives on $12 a day. Right. And you have some people, they're like, oh yeah, $7 a day and I just make it work. How are you enjoying this? Right. And the fun thing about that experience is I realized I wasn't backpacking. A, I had a big ass suitcase that I'm rolling everywhere. Right. And mind you, you're in like Vietnam. It's not on solid ground. Right. I'm rolling this wheelie bag on dirt roads. And I'm hopping on, because I didn't have the money to like take a real taxi. So like, let me get on this little Vespa. You just put my big suitcase in front of you. You sit here and then I sit behind you and we're all just going. How large would you say the suitcase was? About your size, I mean, because there's different size suitcases. Yeah. So you could have a carry-on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a carry-on. No, no, it wasn't a carry-on. It, it would need to be checked. It was definitely at least up to, like, where my knee was from right. the floor. And I had the expandable inch out. So I was just coming back from Japan, and I don't know why I didn't think, maybe just ship everything home. Right. No, I'm just going to bring it all myself. I'm going to, like, try and carry as much as I can. So I decided to take all of my wardrobe including like winter stuff. Right. Mind you, Vietnam is on the equator. It's hot. <laughs> I just want you to understand why I'm carrying winter stuff. I was like, what did you have in your bag? A, a jacket. Yeah, I had jackets and sweaters and tights and stuff. And I put them all in those uh, airlock bags right. and had to vacuum it down. So the funny thing is, leaving Japan, I'm like vacuuming everything. And when did it occur to me that I wouldn't have a vacuum? That you wouldn't have to get it all back in the suitcase. No. So, that so you spent 45 days going mm -hmm. through Vietnam, Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Did you do any other places? No, but like within there. So in Vietnam, I started from the north. I started at um, Hanoi, worked my way down to like um, Ha Long Bay, Hoi An, Nha Trang, Ho Chi Minh City. Then moved over to Cambodia and worked my way up through like four different cities. So would you consider that your love for travel and your travel style would say, are you a backpacker? Because basically you said you went through 45 days backpacking. I sure am not a backpacker. Okay. <laughs> That's a, that was a different experience. And it's not to say I wouldn't do it again. I would definitely do it smarter. I actually would take a backpack this time. A real backpack. Yeah, literally. a real backpack. I would actually be in a backpack. But I would never stay in a hostel there. Did you stay in a hostel that time? I sure didn't. So I your travel there. style is not backpacking? No. I'm hotels three stars and above. Three, that's the minimum. Three stars is the minimum. Because three stars in different places is different. Yes. So, like, being from Las Vegas, three stars is very different than going to some other random right. city. And I won't denigrate any particular city <laughs> and seeing what their three stars are. Our three stars are most other places four stars. Right. So, 
I'm not saying that we need to like stay in Thailand again in a hotel that has actual honeycomb dripping raw honey down <laughs> so that I can like put honey <laughs> on my in my tea or something. Right. Which is a true Straight story. <laughs> it was amazing. I walked up to their breakfast buffet and I was like, is that a honeycomb? Just drink Hotel honey? Muse in Bangkok. Very nice. Oh, right. it, was, it was amazing. Like, that was an amazing experience. I don't need that every time. Right. But I do need, like, room service. Okay. Because you don't know what your day is going to bring. So in Vietnam, every hotel I stayed in, I was like, it has to have room service. Right. I walked into one hotel and they started off kind of wonky. And they're like, no, we don't have room service. And I was I'm going to pull out my iPad, I'm going to pull up your website, and I'm going to show you <laughs> where it says that you have room service. And I don't know why I was doing it. It's not like it was going to change their mind and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to implement this while you're here, because they're like, well, we don't have that. So it's not backpacking. No. Nah. Are you super high-end? Are you a luxury? Well, you said three stars, so luxury is five stars, so it doesn't yeah. have to be luxury. No, I'm not luxury, because, I mean, I don't have luxury money, so. That's... Okay, so three stars, room yeah. service. When you travel, do you travel economically do you have to only take taxi are you a train bus my preference is public transportation and that's because well I think it gives you an opportunity to see people in their natural element in a way that you do not in a taxi right. in a taxi you're really just kind of looking out seeing whereas in a um, on a train you're up close and personal seeing how people are living their lives plus it really gives you a better relation mm -hmm. of geography so for me, when I show up in a city, the first day is super uncomfortable because I know where nothing is and I don't have an understanding of spatial arrangement. But after five days of taking buses and trains and right. looking at it on my right. phone, I'm like, I know this city. So would you say that you're um, a cultural purveyor or would you say that you actually like to integrate yourself to really experience it? Oh, I sure don't. I sure do not. Okay. I'm... I want to see the culture. I want to learn the history, right. but I'm not someone who's like, I want to go up and talk to these locals. I want to get invited to someone's house and go to dinner and understand like what their motivations right. are as a human being because I don't like human beings like that. Uh, I want to understand <laughs> the... <laughs> I know. It's the truth, though. I mean, I could lie. <laughs> yeah, I just love people. I just want to know. I want to know what they're doing. Right. No. I just want to... I want to understand how their lives are and the cultural events that led up to how people are living their lives. Right. So, like, museums are amazing for me. And obviously, like, um, your basic art museums and classical art museums, mm -hmm. but also, like, in Bogota, going to their gold museum. Right. And understanding how the history of gold really played into the indigenous culture and how they became who they are now right. is really interesting. Or even in Bogota, going on a street art tour mm -hmm. and seeing all of these murals that are from, from a youth that's mm -hmm. really showing something about their culture. Right. I think you can learn as much from looking at someone's artwork as you can from having that conversation because their art is, it's something it's what they maybe wouldn't say out loud, mm -hmm. just pour it out into paint. It's right. almost more intimate than right. having that conversation with someone. So for me, it's, it's about being on the outside looking in and getting an understanding of what's there. So by being more of a historian and you mm -hmm. taking that aspect mm -hmm. of it, do you, when you choose your countries, when you've chosen your countries, do you choose based off what speaks to you? Are you a big planner? It's a mixture of both. So. Um, I'll find something that just gives me inspiration. Okay. And inspiration comes in a lot of different ways. Um, I was supposed to go to Slovenia recently, and I just read on the list just charming cities in Europe. And I thought, well, I need to be there. Okay. I just need to go. Right. And there was no real reason. I don't know any... I literally, even going there, someone's like, well, where is Slovenia? And I was like, right. it's above and next to some other countries and maybe by water. So does it have to be an old city? Does it have to be a new city? Because are you planning these trips? Like, are you just... Oh, I'm planning the heck out of them. I'm, I'm looking up everything that I can do, but it doesn't have to be an old city. It doesn't have to be a new city. It just has to be somewhere that speaks to me at that time and place okay. in my life. So when I'm looking for something, it's usually what's hitting, literally it is, just like what's hitting my soul okay. right now. Okay. And so for some places it'll be I just want to go to like a charming city like 
in Slovenia. And other times I just need an energetic city that's going to keep up with the frenetic pace of my energy. Right. And so it's at any given moment what is inspiring me. Because there was like a time where I needed to go to Estonia and I didn't make it there at that time. And now I think, well, why did I want to go there so bad? And I literally cannot think of a single reason. You're other very, than You were like really on top of Estonia and uh, Azerbaijan. Oh, I still want to go to Azerbaijan. Um, do you follow any travel influencers? Because in 2019, picking a city based off of Instagram pictures, um, people really do choose their travel based off of like, what the top three are yeah as opposed to 2014 lonely planet was probably still doing really well trip advisor mm -hmm. uh, was still a really big platform do you do you follow any travel influencers yes and no so i do follow like black travel movement on facebook okay. and it's helpful in some ways so like i found myself in switzerland and i had no idea what to do and i just happened to be scrolling through and someone was in in switzerland at like I think they call it like the top of the world because right. it's their highest peak in the Alps. Okay. And it looked beautiful. And I thought, oh, well, I didn't know what I was going to do here. That. I'm going to do that. Right. But in a lot of ways, I typically find that if I see something on Instagram, I don't want to go there. Because at this point, I don't want to go to places that have a less than authentic experience. Okay. So, like, take Paris. I would imagine going to Paris in the 50s was probably the ultimate experience. Even as a black person? Actually, even as a black person. Oh, well, yes, they did accept that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was a whole different world. Whereas now, like going to Paris, it's, it's so cliche. Okay, so your thing is you like to kind of be a voyeur of cultures and mm -hmm. watch from the outside. But if you don't actually get to know a local and, and scratch that level, would you be able to, with how... Um, like how popular some destinations are now actually get to experience the culture from the outside in without moving past the tourism block. You would literally have to. And so the thing for me is that, particularly because I've been doing 30 for 30, every place I was going to had to be new. It had to be a first time. Right. It wasn't like I could repeat. So like I've been to Paris once and when you go there, you have to go to the Louvre. You have to see the Eiffel Tower. Right. So you literally don't even have time to get into scratching the surface and seeing something truly real about their culture because you have to get through all of that. Now let's say I win again. Now I've done a lot of the main tourist things, so maybe I could have that experience. Maybe it wouldn't feel so mundane. How would you, how do you top your 30 by 30? You've done 30 countries, you are 30. How do you top that? How do you feel, like, what's your next goal? I mean, how do you top that? So you spend, like, yes, I spent the last seven years working toward a goal, but ultimately that's a full lifetime goal. Like 30 by 30 is on average one per year. You spent your entire life getting here right. and thinking that at least the last, like, five years, I've been running at a breakneck pace of, like really just planning my entire life around making it to seven to nine countries per year. After I hit 30, I was like, well, what's next? And I still haven't figured it out. But you still love travel. I still love travel, but I mean, someone asked, oh, are you going to do 50 and 50? And I was like, well, that's not really a challenge. Are you fulfilled? Oh, no, I was totally fulfilled with hitting the 30 by 30, but just... Putting a number on it doesn't really pose a challenge anymore. So you have no next goal? Not yet. I'm still on the lookout. Does this make you sad? A little bit, yes, because it's an end of a major era in my life. Right. And so you finish that and you think, well, travel's still going, but it's not as focused for me. And I'm a mission-oriented person, so you're know, like, you're still traveling, you're still going to amazing places, but there's no goal to it, which is weird to me. When you were in Switzerland, what mm -hmm. was your best moment? It was the up in the clouds thing, what was it called? So I didn't make it to the top of the world, only because it was like a three hour train ride that I was gonna have to do round trip in a single day. Uh -huh. and I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. Also, I looked at the weather and it was like 20 degrees up there and I had a trench coat because I hadn't packed for that. So I did still go to the Alps. I went to Lucerne and went to the top of Mount Pilatus, which every time I say it, I feel like I'm overpronouncing. I did tell someone there, and they're like, no, you're saying it right. I was like, really, Pilatus? 
That <laughs> seems a bit excessive. However, I went up there and it's about 7,000 feet up mm -hmm. and you're just in the clouds and it is, there's something so calming about it. In the right. same way that most people feel calm, like at the beach, uh -huh. I'm not really a beach person. I just feel like I've got too much nervous energy within me to like right. just I'm sit in sand. Up. Yeah. It's meh. So up there, there was no visibility. You literally couldn't see farther than like your hand. Mm -hmm. And I did think, I was like, well, this is a little bit of a letdown because I'm at 7,000 feet and I see nothing like of what's on the ground. But then I thought, you're literally just standing in clouds. Now I thought this really quickly because my fingers were starting to turn blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I was super excited when the clouds cleared up. I saw the view. I was like, perfect. I had no visibility. I've got full visibility and I'm going to leave while I still have my fingers. Did you get good pictures? Uh, Nothing matters if you didn't get good pictures today. I mean, Instagram. I got pictures of the white, <laughs> which... <laughs> But the view came. You didn't get good pictures. You know, I did get a few good pictures. And then someone's like, oh, can I take your photo? Or do you want me to take your photo? I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And I thought they were going to step back, and they're like right here. <laughs> and I was like, well, I could have done that as a selfie. Like, <laughs> Why are it's you so in my space? Take three steps back and oh. three feet in front of me, six in back. You know, it's, it's stressful when you try and ask people to take pictures of you because then you realize how few people know how to take pictures because they are either all in your face right. and you have no background or they decide to stand like 10 feet away from you uh -huh. and leave you all in the background. It's like okay. you can't see me. <laughs> So do you believe in documentation of your trips? Like, is it just so I came and you have a great story to tell? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel that people want to hear, like, you gotta, you have to have pictures to kind of back up what you're saying? Because in today, era. It, it's different. Yeah. So I do take a lot of pictures. I've always taken a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. Whether I show them to other people, that's where I find, like, I have the personal breakdown. I am like so crappy at Facebook and Instagram and general social media because I'll take like 50 photos of one thing and then never post any of them. So what is your favorite type? If you hate beach vacations, mm -hmm. I love beach vacations, but you hate beach vacations. I do. What are your favorite type of holidays then? I'm a city person. I love being in a city and feeling the energy because you really feel like you're connected like, if you're going to the beach, you're connected to nature, which is, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just different than what I want. In a city, you're connected to, like, the life force of that country. You're connected to people in a different way than you would be if you're on a beach because there's something introspective about a beach, whereas being in a city is, like, I don't know, it's just putting you in the action, mm -hmm. even if you're not interacting necessarily with others. Right. But as far as, like, Photographing, I do take a lot of photos, don't necessarily post them. However, I do think people actually want to see it. Because I used to have a thought process that like no one really cares where I you've been it. and what you've done. But once I started coming back and I would like share photos, people were like, Oh my goodness, I love when you do that. I'm like, oh But well, don't you do that at work? You you like you what do you guys have a board at work, right? You post pictures? Yeah, so we bring back like postcards and then I started sending out emails when I got back. And I wasn't sure if it felt like I was bragging, like, oh, guess where I've been but people are actually really interested they're like oh I love seeing the picture of like the chocolates in Belgium and like the mountain in Switzerland so it was interesting allowing them to see that it really is that beautiful right. there because sometimes you'll see something on like Instagram and you know that that person literally took like 170 shots and even then after they digitally retouched it to right. high heaven. Right. Whereas if you're seeing like that photo from someone that you just know and that you know isn't like over there digitally retouching anything because they barely <laughs> showed it to you in the first place. Right. You're like, oh, it really does look like this. I might want to go there. So do you think you've inspired anybody? I mean, I'd like to believe I have. I have a list of people that don't have their passports, and I like to just check in with them, like, <laughs> once every two weeks, like, hey, have you thought about it you yet? You're bullying them. I, I would hardly like to say it's bullying. I really want to believe that I'm leading them to finding things that they might not have found on their own. Right. It's bullying. It's, it's not. It's I, kind of, it's almost there. I mean, it's a gentle, it's like, hey, I, I remember you saying that it would be cool to, like, find a husband here. You're not going to find that husband there if you don't get your passport and go. Did you get your passport today? 
Yeah. Or like... Hey, bro. Hey. Good morning. Did you get your passport? Yeah, like Christmas time. Like, oh, you know it would be a really fun present to tell people to get you? Right. Your passport. Did you leave the applications on your desk? Ooh, I did leave some global entry uh, cards on people's desk. Oh, that's a really good point. So do you believe in all of the... I mean, I believe in them. But mm-hmm. do you believe in like global entry, clear, TSA pre-check? Yes. I sure do. And you know why I believe in it? Why? I took a trip. We went to Thailand the second time with Diambe. And (laughs) I had applied for my global entry, but I needed to do my interview. My interview was after Thailand. Right. She had already gotten hers. Right. So we walk up to uh, security. She's like, oh, I'm going to go through the known crew member line because she's a flight attendant. I was like, oh, okay. I'm just, I'll walk through this line then. I was like, well, that's, that doesn't seem right, but whatever. <laughs> then upon entering the country, she's like, well, I got global entry, so I'm going to go through that line. So she just left you. Yes. And here's the funny thing. I got stuck behind someone who was getting deported. <laughs> I was in that line for so long because apparently the woman came in with, like, no visa. And no other line would take me. So I'm just sitting there like, okay. And I can see Diambe behind her like, You know, walk away from me. here? You know, it's time for us to go. I'm going to catch a taxi. I'll see you. <laughs> right? So after that, I thought, okay, I truly understand why I need TSA pre-check. Because one, it's amazing not taking off my shoes. It's amazing not taking off my belt and feeling like I'm like stripping down. Oh my God. So coming home this time, I mm. forgot what TSA pre-check was. Oh, I mean, because no. I have clear and I have mm-hmm. TSA pre-check. Yeah. Which actually does it, it does make a difference in the Atlanta airport. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming in and I go and I'm just like, I'm, I'm hesitant. It's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. She's mm-hmm. like, just go. And I came through with my bracelets and they're just like, they being, I'm like, do you have to make me take these off? Because you just let me keep everything else on. Right. But it is the best way to travel. So did you learn that because of 30 by 30 or did you learn that because of your siblings? That was probably closer to siblings. Because well, you. Oh. I mean, because she left me, yeah, for sure. However, I had another time where I was coming through, like, the roughest trip. It was after I got global entry, which also gets you pre-check. And they didn't put it on my boarding pass. And this was after, um, it was after a three-country trip. So I'd gone to Indonesia, Malaysia, and United Arab Emirates. And I had taken the longest flight back from Abu Dhabi to New York, And in New York, I was just a mess. Like, my bag was just stuffed full because I had bought a bunch of things while I was there, and I lost one sock. (laughs) And because I didn't have pre-check, I, like, put on one sock when I realized that I was going to have to go through the security and take off my shoes like regular folk. And I thought, where's my... Yes, I'm like, where's my other sock? I can't find it. And the TSA agent had the nerve to look down and say, you know you only have one sock on. (laughs) Like, well, because you could have lost your sock. Maybe it was on the belt. You never know. Maybe, but I had just been through, like, a rough life. So in my mind, I was like, you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> and for you to bring up this sock is a real affront to me. <laughs> so I was like, yes, yes, I know. I'm going to go on through the line if I can go. Is <laughs> that okay? <laughs> Did you have to do the machine? Yes. Oh, sock, no sock, it doesn't matter. Right, so I'm sitting in there with, like, one foot on the ground, one on my tippy toes, his hands in the air. You think your sock was soaked in, like... <laughs> I don't know. And then I happened to have my speaker on me at the time, and this is one of the speakers where when you turn on the on button, it's, like, powering on, and it turned on as I was going through security. I was like, please don't take me back to a room. <laughs> so after that, I'm like, yes, pre-check, because I never want to open this bag. Oh, so you didn't have pre-check. Okay, because I'm like, you just didn't know how to put your known member number in? Um... I had had it and it didn't go, I don't know why it didn't go through, or maybe I just should have checked my boarding pass to make sure that it had gone through. But after that, I realized there's real reasons. And then I got clear because you had sent me the uh, free three months and I didn't Uh realize that you put in your credit card at the time to get your free three months. And I was getting close to the three months and I was like, I don't know if I, do I want this? Do I want it? I'm not sure. And then they sent me an email. Hey, we charged your card. You're a member now. I was like, well, I guess, I guess I do want it. So. Right. It's good at some airports. Oh, in Vegas. It's amazing. It's in all of the gates and they are there. If you ever go after 8 p.m. they're not there. Oh, I've had success every time. They're always there hanging out. They're not always there. Oh. Okay. 
I've been through there. They're not always there. You're having a different life. You know what? It's probably because you're going through Terminal 1. Terminal 3, they're great. Well, there's that. There is that. Who flies through Terminal 3? Like, literally everything is through Terminal 3. Except for Delta. It, yeah. Okay. Well, if Delta would like to give me flight benefits, then I would fly with them. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say no to Delta or Terminal 1 if that was an option. So what other trips did you think, or tips, did you find with your 30 by 30? Because there have to be things that ease travel. Nine countries a year, yeah. international, have to be. It gets, you need, you need to be able to get in and out quickly. Nine times a year, that's literally three a quarter. Yeah. Or three every well, three months. I would go like every three months and then do like multi-country trips, mm -hmm. which I don't recommend. So that is one thing that I did learn from this. Like I did um, in April a trip to Munich for like a day and a half, then on to Salzburg in Austria for a day and a half, which was fun because the biggest thing that Salzburg is known for is... Um, Salzburg State. Oh, no, I was going to say Mozart is from there, uh -huh. but also they filmed... Uh, the Sound of Music, which I'd never seen. So everywhere you go, people are like, oh, this is from The Sound of Music. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that. Did you ever watch it? I still haven't. No, you don't want to sing and <laughs> dance to the streets. <laughs> well, now if I saw it, it would have, like, real cultural meaning to right. me because I would have been there. So now I will watch it. But we were only there for a short period of time, and even then we did a day tour off to Hallstatt, which is one of the other most charming cities in Europe. Okay. And then after there, we went to Prague for a day and a half. And let me tell you, Prague has a lot to do. Prague is huge. Prague is, it's huge and it's packed. It's just packed to the gills with history and culture at every corner. Mm -hmm. So we did like a seven hour walking tour, which afterwards I thought maybe someone should just cut off my feet because it would be less painful. Did you walk the entire seven hours or was it busing? Because there, there, I did a, a seven hour mm -hmm walking tour in Barcelona? No, there was busing for like the first hour, but after that it really was walking on cobblestone. Uh -huh. And let me tell you, they were talking about these are cobblestones from that are over a thousand years old. They were, they were worn in season. <laughs> oh my goodness. They were, they were uneven and uncomfortable. But what I would tell you is that after that trip, I was exhausted. I was dead tired. I needed a vacation just to vacate from that vacation. Because it sounds like one and a half, one and a half, that's three. Mm -hmm. And one and a half, so you did it less than seven days? I did. But public transportation had to have been great. It was awesome in Munich. Not so much in Salzburg, but it's so small that you don't need public transportation. And in Prague, we just hoofed it everywhere. So, okay, when you're choosing the places... Mm -hmm. Do you have particular resources you like, or do you just kind of just... Oh, I'm all about Pinterest. Pinterest is amazing. So anyone who's not using it for trips is missing out significantly. Right. So what I'll do is I'll say, just look up 24 hours in Salzburg, mm -hmm. and it's going to tell you the top 10 things you have to do. And a lot of people will kind of give itineraries, and it's not that I'll necessarily take one person's itinerary, but I'll splice together a few that have interesting things. But that way, I 100% know what to do. And for London, it was super helpful. Mm -hmm. I looked up like um, 72 hours in London, and I found one place that actually gave like, here's where you start with, and then this is like, however many feet away. So do you put your itineraries that you, because you create really good itineraries, mm -hmm. do you put them on um, Pinterest? Or do you do you participate oh. in the culture that you're stealing from? I mean, I'm certainly not stealing. They're putting it out there for me to enjoy. So do you put your itineraries there? I haven't yet. And the only reason that I haven't is because apparently most people don't like the breakneck pace with which I uh, plan things. But some of them are. I was on Lonely Planet because I looked mm -hmm. there. That's a good option. Mm -hmm. And they have three or four day itineraries mm -hmm. of things to do. Who knows? You might there might be other Lexies out there that like to do one hundred things in a twelve hour period. I just feel like there's so much to see that if you're not running, you're missing out on things. So like take London into consideration. Right. We were planning well I was planning intensely and yes, I did forget food. I did put in like one meal in the week. And it was a good meal. So I'll That was your birthday. Yeah. I don't even feel like you chose that, I think no, no, I did choose that. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, okay, it was really good. It was really good. Nevertheless, there were so many things to do. You've got museums to hit. You've right. got shows to watch. Right. You have stores to go to. 
everything needs to be done. And what are you going to do? Just not do it? Come back and say, yeah, I didn't see Buckingham Palace. I mean, that's a huge thing, though. You could say, yeah, I didn't walk down this one street today. I can't think of what we could, what we could there, do. We did everything. There was nothing that we couldn't have, like, that we... There was nothing that I would have taken out. So, like, things that we didn't get to do. We didn't get to go to the... Oh, was some museum of art. Yes. The, the Tate oh, the Modern Museum. Tate Modern, yeah. That would have been awesome. Granted, I don't actually love modern art all that much. Did you like MoMA in New York? You know what? I didn't go to MoMA in New York. I went to the Met. See? Break neck pace, and you didn't even do that. Oh, my goodness. New York was insane, and I didn't do that. Like... We started first thing in the morning. I have actually never, even in Prague, felt so much pain in my feet because it was July and it was humid and I probably wasn't drinking enough water and they started swelling as we were walking. <laughs> but we we walked through Central Park. We went to the top of the rock to see um, the top of Rockefeller Center to see the Empire State Building from there. We went to the Met. We went to the Natural History Museum. This is all in one day. We took a tour around... Um, whatever water source that is, to see the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I don't even remember it. <laughs> I don't. I thought we were going to, like, leave somewhere in Brooklyn, and we were looking at it and thought, you know what? I'm wearing, I've got my camera, my passport, and money on me. Let's go back to our hotel, drop everything off, and then go to Coney Island at night. <laughs> at least you at least dropped the stuff off. We did. I'm happy we did, because if I was at Coney Island at night with, like, my camera, my right. deal, um. Oh, SLR, I would have felt some type of way. That's a really good. Do you ever check the travel state's government website to see if the countries are safe that you're going to? Like, yes, but I don't know if I take them seriously. Okay. So because you feel like you, you, feel, you feel connected to the location. <laughs> no, I just feel like every place is considered dangerous. Like, so living in Japan made it super apparent that people are somewhat afraid to come to the U.S. Like, oh, am I going to get shot there? It's like, yeah, probably not, but you never know. I also don't want to say you won't because we don't know what's going to happen. And so you think I could be anywhere at home and get shot. Right. What's dangerous after that? So you don't need a warning. You're going to go mm -hmm. and figure it out. I mean, the few times I've like let warnings dissuade me, I feel like I missed out. So like I didn't go to um, Istanbul this year because they're like, oh, it's a little dangerous. I thought, yeah, it's, it's dangerous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be safe. And then I realized I should have been there. I should have just gone. I still will. You don't think that it's a bit dangerous? I mean, with the whole... Okay, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's where we, we did go to Nicaragua. And that was... That we was, went, yeah. I think like the, the warnings were, might have actually kind of slightly been correct. But we lived. You're here, you I'm not? here. Exactly. And we could have. I mean, you got it being a waste of money. There was absolutely nothing to do there because the whole country was shut down. I mean, if we were in a lesser house, I would have been mad. It was a nice house. But we had like a full staff. So I was staff. good with that. No, I just think. Um, Imagine there had been a budget vacation. Had that been a budget when vacation? When they shut down the hostels, mad. that's when you knew it was time to go. True. When they were like, they were they gave the hostels. I was like, shit. Mm hmm. No, I think you can go anywhere. You just have to be smart. So that's one of the biggest things. Like for me, I'll go out at night in some places, but others I won't. So like Bogota, once it started getting dark, I was like, well, I better get my Uber, especially since it looks like my phone's down to 11%, get back to my hotel. But then <laughs> Uber not come or something? No, thankfully I was good everywhere there, but I was down to like 4%. Jeez. I was like, please get me in this car, and I hope you have a, a port where I can charge because... Did it make you nervous? That did make me nervous because I was too far away. I was like, I'm not going to be able to walk this. And I felt really comfortable in Bogota, but not that comfortable. Because I had this one point where I was walking. I was just walking around these neighborhoods, and I'd had, like, an Uber take me to this market. I was like, I don't know how I feel about this place. And I was just wandering around, and finally someone's like, oh, where are you going? I'm just walking. Yeah, I'm just walking. It's like, oh, you know, it's probably better back that way. Maybe, maybe don't go this way. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm just going to turn around then. <laughs> because it, it seemed like they were genuinely just trying to tell me, you don't look like you're from here and you maybe should stop while you're ahead. And I was like, I'll take your word for it and go back this way. So do you find language barriers being an issue? Most places, no. 
Columbia was the one place where I was struggling because I thought, yeah, I've taken Spanish when I was younger and I've got this. Mm -hmm. I didn't got this. Well, Cuba was hard too, though. Cuba was really... Cuba was hard. But most other places I've gone, like, English is just so prominent in the world that you can kind of suffer by with a few words. And I find that if you can say hello and thank you and how do I get to the bathroom in most languages, people... <laughs> Well, no, people really appreciate that you even took the time to attempt that, which is funny, though, because if you ever say hello with even something close to a good accent, they're like, take off in their language. And then that's when you stop and you're like, English? No, 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 no. Yeah. And it's never stopped me, though. I think that's something about Japan is that I can have an entire conversation just pantomiming everything. I'm like expert level at that. So do you think in the 30 by 30, what culturally has impacted you the most or changed who you actually are by going through the different countries and watching mm -hmm. and seeing what has made you want to do something different? Or, I mean, even like matured you in a sense. Well, I mean, Japan was the most significant and how could it not be? I spent two and a half years there, a little right. under two and a half years. And I'd gone over at 21 after not having gone to very many countries and it was... It was a singular experience. Mm -hmm. So I basically just quit my job mm -hmm. that I had been doing an internship and moved it into a role. And I thought, that's fine. I'm just going to leave this behind. I'm going to take out all my money and I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Like I even cashed in my 401k for that. Mm -hmm. And I know I was young. Now, I mean, but you, you took in a culture and it changed who you are. It did. And literally, as I was dropped off at the airport with like mom and Diambe there, I started crying. And as I was going through security, I thought, maybe I just should turn around, see if I can get my job back and not go. Mm -hmm. Because they're crying and I'm crying and I'm thinking, what am I doing? Right. I'm 21. I'm going to a country that I don't speak the language. And I just have no concept of living on my own like this. Right. So then I got on the plane and I went and it was amazing until the first day I moved into my apartment and I was living on hubris because I had been directed to my apartment and I thought, okay, I've been looking up landmarks. There's this red house. I've got this. This is where I turn. Right. This is how I get to where I'm going. And then that night I'm on the train. We're going back and the person who's escorting me is like, do you think you have it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've got this. I'm fine. Again, with suitcases out wandering these streets. It's and the neighborhood all looks alike because yes. when you dropped me, when I came to visit you, mm -hmm. you were like, just take, just here's the phone, you'll find the train station, meet me for lunch. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that I did that to you after what I went through because I wandered around my neighborhood for about three hours at night and I realized I didn't have the address written down. So even if I had found police officers, I wouldn't have been wow. able to give them an address and I didn't have any language skills. So I'm like, where's this red house? And it's nighttime, so I did find out later the house looks brown at night. And I just started crying, wandering these streets like, <laughs> why would I do this? Why would I leave everything I knew? Um, by the time I got there, I didn't even care that I didn't have an international data plan. I think I called you and I cried for like another hour after that. And it still ended up being an amazing experience living right. there. But it made me realize if I could get through like those experiences... I could get through anything. This is true. So, and that's what travel really does for you, particularly when you're traveling alone. You just have that moment where you realize, if I can get through this, there's nothing that I cannot accomplish in my life. 